welcome to Alt Swift X's A Cock Abridged, in which we read the second book of A Game of Thrones, and we 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 really just cut the crap and get right to the to the meaty chunks, right to the right to the literary nuggets of what this series is about, and we waste no time in getting to the bottom of the mystery of the series. We're like archaeologists who dig through the the geological strata, throwing past the the food descriptions and beyond the the excessively detailed heraldry with like what kinds of griffins is on whose quintain. We get right to the point of what this series is about. Uh, and in this case it's about a a a girl who is struggling to survive in a hostile environment. Um, and it's all a bit upsetting. This is the story of Sansa. This is Sansa 1 at Clash of Kings. And this is also a special occasion. This is, uh, this is the one year anniversary of Old Swift Dex. 24 hours ago, well, slightly more than 24 hours ago, one year ago, uh, to the day, to the hour, uh, we broadcasted the first Alt Shift X from the from the Alt Shift X satellite, um, and um, and it's now grown into um, uh, well, I, I'm not entirely sure what it is that it's grown into, but I like it, and it seems that you like it, so <laughs> we'll keep doing it. Uh, but thank you all for joining, uh, for joining us in this first year special edition. Of a cocker bridge, I can see uh, I've got a lot of y'all in the chat. So welcome, uh, get your get your popcorn uh, and your and your and your um, your greased chins. Get your chins greased. Get them well lubricated because we're going to be doing some hard hitting analysis tonight. Um, I was actually looking up the the system of like gifts that are given at different kinds of anniversaries like you know there's actually a system someone's i don't know i don't know who decided this is how it works but apparently this is how it works the first year anniversary gift is paper apparently like there's a tradition of like at different anniversaries different kinds of gifts are given at the 10th year you're meant to give a gift that contains tin and at the 15th year crystal and the 40th year ruby the first year anniversary is paper and as it happens we got paper. We are we are reading from from a paper book, right? Ain't that appropriate? So next year, apparently, uh, we're meant to we're meant to use cotton. Uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do a cotton themed Alt Shift X episode. We'll work something out. But some of these gifts are really cool. You know, the 35th year uh, traditional gift apparently is coral. Where where is where are people gonna get coral? Uh, have you got to go fucking snorkeling to get to get a gift for your for your thirty fifth year partner? Is that how's everyone expect? And 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 there's lace and ivory and china. Pottery is the ninth year one, and that could be adorable. Like you could you could make some pottery for someone pretty easily, which would, which could be such a sweet gift. I think everyone should give their significant other some kind of like handmade pottery gift on their ninth year. Uh, or maybe for every year, because fuck it, like, who can afford diamonds for the 60th and emerald for the 55th? I reckon we all should just give handmade pottery. These are some relationship tips from Alt Drift X. We should start, we should start a dating advice podcast. That would be fucking great. Like, Alt Swift, um, someone think of what the name should be. I think that'd be great. Um, but we're going to get into this chapter, because... Sansa is having a pretty rough time. Uh, the day dawns bright and windy on King Joffrey's name day, um, with the long tail of the great comet visible through the high scuttling clouds. Um, which, by the way, what? How, do, how does a cloud scuttle? Like, that's one of those sentences that you sort of read it, and you're sort of like, oh, yeah, no, sure, scuttling clouds. But, like, h hang on a minute. Scuttling? What? What? I mean, isn't that the way a, the way a, a, a crab amulates? A ambulates? Isn't that how crab walks? It scuttles? Or maybe, 
Oh, can't you scuttle? You can scuttle a, a, a ship, can't you, to like sink it? Hold on. What what does what does scuttle mean? Uh, scuttle. Oh, hang on a minute. Scuttle noun, a metal container with a handle used to fetch and store coal for a domestic fire. W wow! Look at the facts we're learning already. A scuttle is is a is a is a metal container. <laughs> Um, and the British, apparently, call uh, a part of a car's bodywork between the windscreen and the bonnet a scuttle. What's the... That's a, that's a very specific part of the car between the fucking windscreen and the bonnet, isn't it? Uh, all right, but anyway, but, but no, the verb is to run hurriedly or furtively, so that's like how a crab scuttles. Uh, and the other meaning is an act or sound of scuttling okay oh yeah no okay so another meaning of the word scuttle uh is to is to sink a ship um deliberately apparently because if you scuttle your ship you deliberately sink it apparently um so that's so all right so that would imply that these clouds if they are scuttling surely that implies that someone is deliberately sabotaging these clouds someone is deliberately sinking these clouds um, who is the cloud scuttler? Who who is responsible for the clouds? Who who decides to disperse them? I mean, I mean, God, I suppose he he's got meteorological responsibilities. How and why does God scuttle clouds? That's the real question. Um, apparently, the stream quality is shite, um, which sucks. Unfortunately, there isn't a whole lot I can do about that. Uh, it should work fine in later replay. Um, we'll, we'll have to look into ways to fix that. Um, but the but the Alt Shift X um, secret nuclear submarine underwater uh, does struggle to get decent internet sometimes, uh, unfortunately. All right, so uh, Sansa is like, wow, um, wow, what a morning. Uh, what a great day to be alive. No, she really doesn't. Aris Okart arrives. So Aris Okart of the King's Guard. He arrives to escort Sansa to the tourney grounds because there is a uh there is a tournament happening today in in honor of Joffrey's name day, his birthday. And this tournament is in stark contrast. <laughs> Get it? Because it's it Sansa. It's in it's in contrast to the tourney a year ago, uh, or roughly, or whenever it was in the first book which was this really exciting moment for Sansa um, when she went to the great tourney, uh, the hands tourney, uh, in celebration of Ned Stark arriving at King's Landing. Um, and that was the one where, like, Sandor and Gregor Clegane fought, uh, and, like, um, and, like, that Aaron kid, uh, the, the uh, Sir Hugh of the Vale, rather, got killed. Um, that was Sansa's last tourney, and this tourney is rather different. Um, because there aren't very many people attending this tourney, because everyone's a bit busy with the whole war situation. Um, people aren't too keen to go and, like, joust, um, and, and have fun and be merry when there's, you know, a war to be fought. So there's a bit of a crappy tourney. Um, and it does reflect, I think, the sort of, I don't know, disillusionment and decline, um, which is present not only in Sansa's character, but in the whole sort of book right now. Um... We're entering a period of war and strife, uh, so everything's feeling a bit rocky and a bit downhill, and I think the uh, tourney reflects that. Um, so, the comet is visible above. Uh, one of the features uh, across lots of different POVs in the start of this book is the red comet, the bleeding star, uh, which streaks across the sky, and which is interpreted in many different ways by many different characters. Um, so, like, you know, Melisandre thinks that that means that Stannis is Azora High, and Gendry thinks that it's a red-hot sword fresh out of the forge, and Sansa asks, yo, Sir Aris, what do you think this comet is? And he says, oh, it means glory to your betrothed. So Aris answers at once. Uh, it's, it's, it's up there to bring glory to Joffrey on his name day, as if the gods themselves had raised a banner in his honour. Um... But Sansa is sceptical. Sansa thinks that, that well, um, Joffrey's a Baratheon as much as a Lannister, uh, so shouldn't it be a golden comet for, for Baratheon gold instead of Lannister crimson? Um, 
And so Sansa is skeptical of that particular BS. But I also wonder if Aris, Sir Aris Okart, even really believes that. Because, like, one of the themes of this chapter is about how Sansa has to lie and conceal her real emotions um, and, and, and stick to the party line in order to survive in King's Landing. I wonder if Sir Aris Okart, I mean, as a Kingsguard, he obviously has to do the same thing to a certain extent. In order to fulfill his duty, in order to politically survive, he needs to please the despotic King Joffrey. Um, so I wonder, like, when, when Aris immediately says, oh, the comet means glory to, to King Joffrey, I wonder if he really believes that, or if he's just saying it to survive, or if there's even a difference between those two things. Like, we're going to talk a lot about how Sansa's trapped uh, in this circumstance, here in this chapter, but I also wonder to what extent that's also true of the Kingsguard. These Kingsguard are sworn for life to be loyal um, to the king, um, and if that means being loyal to King Joffrey, you're going to have a hard time, I think. So I, I, I wonder what it's like for them as well. Um, but second page, Aris says, you look very lovely today, my my lady, um, and we have a description of how, how Aris Okard is very dashing in his uh in his nice clothes and he's all very knightly and this is exactly the sort of stuff that Sansa loved um back in the day in the last tourney she was so excited about you know like the the the, the beautiful Beric Dondarrion who was a young dashing figure and of course now it's uh, uh the the strongest armor that she's got at the moment um and Sansa mentions that Aris for all his you know dashing impressive nature um, he beats Sansa on the command of Joffrey uh, semi-regularly, as most of the Kingsguard do. Um, so that's just another representation of how, you know, the idea of pageantry and knightliness and the, all that romance is something that Sansa no longer believes in, uh, as she once did. Um, so yeah, the tourney is not as impressive this year. Um, and Sansa talks about how, you know, that first tourney last book was one of the most magical days of her life, but now it seems a memory from a different age. Sansa has grown up and changed, um, and sees the world differently now. Uh, and Sansa is also trying to strategize to work out how to survive Joffrey on this day. Joffrey is a horrible, tyrannical, sadistic shit leader. Uh, and he likes to beat Sansa, and Sansa needs to be very careful how she treads in order to avoid violence. Um, she, Sansa hopes that Cersei will be around uh, to restrain her son, because Joffrey is apparently less violent and awful when Cersei's around, which is, uh, which is pretty dire, I think. It's a bit grim when your ally is Cersei, when the person you're relying on to protect you from physical harm is Cersei. Uh, because Cersei is is not exactly the most um, benevolent character in the world. And yet, that is who Sansa has to rely on to some extent. Um, and we have a description of the tourney grounds itself, and there's a gallery and lists, and, and this is all happening within the Red Keep itself, within, like, the castle, which is uh, hardly ideal, but they're doing it there because this is wartime, and they've got to do it within the castle for the sake of safety. Um, uh, so the war is... is the, 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 this. This really makes the war feel like a, an oppressive, restrictive thing, I think. Um, this shows how the war is, like, you know, e even here, miles away from wherever any actual battle is happening, even here the presence of the war is felt as like this, as like this intensity and like this omnipresent danger, and that's why this tourney is restricted um, and pushed back into the castle. No one's as relaxed um, as they ever normally would be. Um, these are dangerous times. Um, and we have a description of some of the people in the crowd. It's very much, um, it's a pretty motley crew, I would say. Uh, the people who are at, at attendance include Giles Rosby, known for his coughing, uh, Tant Stokeworth, um, Jalabar Zio, Jalabar Zio, who, by the way, is, um, who, by the way, is a funny character. Jellabazo is from the Summer Isles. He's one of the very few black characters in A Song of Ice and Fire. Um, and he just sort of, like, hangs around at court as a guest of King Robert. Um, and apparently the Lannister regime has been happy to take him on as well. Um, but Jellabazo was, like, a prince in the Summer Isles. Um, and he hangs around in the Red Keep. He was always badgering King Robert to ask Robert to help him reclaim his... Uh, throne? I don't think it was a throne, but he had some kind of political power position in su in the Summer Isles. And he's always saying, like, King Robert, yo, like, you come and help me reclaim, um, 
reclaim my my old seat in the Summer Isles. Um, and a lot of people point out that pointed out that that makes Jalabar arguably kind of a villain to some extent because the Summer Isles in the World of Ice and Fire are described as having all of these uh, cultural systems and rituals which make the Summer Isles more peaceful. It's des- it's described as like utopic because um, the wars there don't result in thousands of deaths like they do in Westeros. It's actually a kind of like ritual ritualized warfare where the only people who actually like like very few people die and it's all very organized and like religious or I, I don't remember the details but like warfare in the summer isles is really um deliberately made not too damaging and people point out that like if Jalabazio succeeded in getting king robert to bring a westerosi army to the summer isles there's no way that Westerosi army is going to abide by the Summer Isles restrictions on how warfare is meant to be conducted in a more safe and peaceful way. Uh, Jalabazio would be bringing the foreign spectre and horror of war to the otherwise peaceful Summer Isles, which is arguably a, a, a monstrous crime to inflict on the peaceful Summer Isles. So maybe Jalabazio is really irresponsible in that sense. Or maybe George Martin just didn't think of that particular piece of world building when he invented the character of Jalabazio. Who knows? Um, other people have argued that, like, the whole sort of, like, u- u- utopic, beautiful, like, um, uh, image of the Summer Isles that's written in the World of Ice and Fire, maybe that's, like, sort of mythologized and not accurate. Um, because, like, you know, the World of Ice and Fire deliberately does, like, unreliable narrator sort of stuff where, you know, when the, the descriptions of these distant, exotic places are not meant to, meant to necessarily be realistic, um there's like a very real history of places being misunderstood and mythologized you ever hear about timbuktu like timbuktu was for a long time um considered um it was thought of as like one of those like mythical like cities of gold like el dorado people thought that timbuktu in west africa was was a place where you know there was the streets were paved with gold and there were gemstones embedded into every wall a place of fabulous wealth um, and, and none of those things are remotely true, uh, of Timbuktu. Timbuktu was an interesting place. It was, it was like a thriving, like, trading place, um, and, and academically, like, some of the greatest, like, it, it was like a center of, like, Islamic academia, like, like, back in, like, the medieval times, um, and... And, and, and it was it was an interesting place. It wasn't a city of gold, yet everyone thought it was. Like, there was all this, like, garbled mythologization that happened in, like, travelers' accounts. Uh, totally inaccurate. But people thought about Timbuktu in a different way than it actually was real. And maybe uh, the Summer Isles is something similar. We got to a point. Guys. Okay, um, so... It's a tourney. It's not a very impressive tourney. Um, but the king is sitting there, one leg thrown negligently over the carved wooden arm of his chair. He's sitting there with, uh, Marcella and Tommen and Sandor Clegane. Quite, quite a, quite a motley little family, I would say. Um, and Sandor, Sandor, I think, embodies a lot of the, like, contrast and juxtaposition between, um, between, like, the... Uh, the romantic notion of, like, knighthood and pageantry and the uh, harsh, rougher reality. Because Sandor is wearing a snowy a snowy cloak uh, draped over his shoulders with a jeweled brooch, the Kingsguard cloak, which, which I think represents, like, that, like that idealized version um, of, of knighthood and pageantry. Um, but, but under the cloak, he wears brown rough spun tunic and, and a studded, a studded leather jerkin. And Sansa points out that it looks somehow unnatural, that contrast. And I think the rough spun tunic represents that sort of rough reality underlying the idealized knighthood stuff. So I think Sandor embodies that distinction, which is so critical to Sansa's arc. Sansa's arc is about her um, realizing and exploring and navigating that distinction between ideal and harsh reality, and Sandor, Sandor embodies that. Um, the roughness of his voice and the burn scars on his face, he embodies that. Um, Marcella and Tommen are there. Tommen's adorable. Plump little Prince Tommen jumps up eagerly and says, Sansa, Sansa, did you hear? I'm going to ride in the tourney. It's going to be so exciting. Um, and Tommen is eight years old, the same age as Bran, which which is which is so crazy. 
<laughs> Tom and Brown are the same age. Because Tom and feel it's like Tom seems like 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 a six year old or, or someone way younger. Like all he cares about is like kittens and stamping things. Meanwhile, Bran of the same age um, is is off like learning eldritch tree secrets from from a corpse man um, with Blood Raven and stuff. There's, it's 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 amazing how kids grow up fast when they're chucked into the deep end, like the Stark kids are. Um, but, uh, but Marcella and Tommen being cloistered away in the, in the Red Keep, um, do not grow up so fast. Um, but they retain their childhood, which is, which is, you know, it's, it's probably a good thing that children get to be children. Um, one of the lines that we get later in this chapter is Marcella saying, declaring haughtily, that we're children, we're supposed to be childish, Marcella says. Um, and that, and that I think... It can be seen as like a tragic comment on like childhood is not something that gets to happen much in this series uh, half the pov characters of the series are children they don't really get to have childhoods Arya is deprived of a childhood she has to survive in a violent world and she she gets no time for, for vulnerability or for safety you know bran goes through a lot of the same stuff john's pretty old he goes through a lot of the same stuff um there are very few children in this series who get to be children. Tom and Marcella are some of the only ones, um, which is a tragic thing, I think. Um, and so Tom is exciting that, excited that he's going to ride in the tourney, um, and um, and he's going to fight a he's going to fight a straw knight, a, like a stuffed fake opponent is who um, is who he's going to fight. Uh, Ashar Osborne ninety five. Your your test is successful, Ashar. It worked, um, and um, the and Sansa <laughs> Sansa responds playfully to Tommen when Tommen's like, "I'm going to go ride in the in the tourney. It's going to be amazing." Um, and so and so and so she says, "Well, I fear for the life of your foeman," she told Tommen solemnly. So it's adorable that Sansa is playing along with Tommen's childish happiness. Um, even when Sansa's in this dire situation and she's had to grow up so fast, she's indulging Tommen and she's having fun with Tommen, which I think is uh, great. And Joffrey is 13 today, 13 years old. He's tall for his age with the green eyes and golden hair of the Lannisters. Uh, I've got to say, like, Jack Gleason or whatever his name is, the um, actor who plays Joffrey in the series, in the show, um, he, he, I think everyone agrees that he plays a pretty great Joffrey, um, but he doesn't look like Joffrey in the books. Joffrey in the books is tall, with long golden hair. He's meant to be quite handsome, which, no offence, Jack, he, you know, he doesn't quite embody that prince, golden prince look, uh, that Joffrey has in the books, which I think does add to Joffrey's character, um, like, uh, the fact that um, the fact that Joffrey looks like this perfect prince and is actually a nasty little shit, um, just adds further to this old juxtaposition that Sansa's story, uh, explores. Uh, Advar says that Gleason looks like an incest monster baby. Um, I haven't seen many incest monster babies to compare him to. I'm not, I mean, I guess, but, I mean, sure, uh, I wouldn't know, but, I'm. Um, you know, poor Jack. Apparently, apparently Jack Gleason like walks down the street and people like v abuse him. <laughs> people like verbally abuse him because um, they're like, "Oh, you fucking crossbowed those women, mate." Um, which can you imagine that? Can you imagine just walking down the street and having people hurl abuse at you for a character that you play? Like Cersei, um, what's her name? Lena Headey says the same thing. People just fucking come at you, and and you know, conversely. Um, actors who play like heroes and like lovable actors they get all the praise in the world when they're walking down the street um even though you know let's be real they didn't really earn it in a lot of ways like oh like comedy actors like comedy actors who um are hilarious in their movies a lot of why they're hilarious like it depends on the actor i guess but a lot of why a lot of those people are funny is because of their writers right um and 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 yet it's not the writers who get praised walking down the streets. It's people who say who see the actor and think they're hilarious, um, which which is just it's just it just seems unfair that the actor either suffers the the punishment or the reward for for, for something that isn't really their doing at all. Although Stephanie Morris points out, well, it's because they're actors. It's a show. It's fiction. I true. I forgot that. That's 
Occam's razor right there. Uh, anyway, um, no, yeah, Chris Seventy gets it. Imagine just walking around, people screaming at you for for, for beheadings. It's messed up. Anyway, anyway, anyway. Oh, we got a hundred listeners. Amazing. Welcome, all hundred of you. All cent, all century of you. We could start a Roman legion. Wouldn't that be great? Do you guys want to start a, a swift Roman legion? It'll be like LARPing, and we can all put on our um. Oh, what's the terminology? What's what's the Roman jargon? There's great Roman jargon for the for the centurions with the with the special hats and the pointy sticks. Uh, I think we should do an Alt Swift X LARP, is what I'm saying. Um, uh, and yeah, Prof. Cecily Cogsworth uh, points out that yeah, the Jack Gleason retired from acting, I believe. Is it Jack Gleason? I hope that's the right name. The the, the actor who plays Joffrey retired from acting, which seems to me like an incredibly sensible thing to do. Um, he's got, you know, he, 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 I'm sure he had a good time acting in Game of Thrones, and I'm sure he made some money. Um, but he chose not to go through the the career of being an actor, which uh, which strikes me as a good idea. I mean, I'm sure some people love it, um, but like having to, I, I imagine it would be stressful, and like being in the public life would suck. I think, um, even if people aren't berating you for having a crossbow, um, yeah, staying out of acting sounds like a good idea. Anyway. Anyway, I'm not here to give career advice. I'm not your career counsellor. You know what my career counsellor told me when I was in school in, in 1848? Uh, she said, Swift, listen, uh, we've done some complex algorithmic analyses. We've done these brain scans. It was all very advanced back in my day. Uh, career, career advice is pretty rudimentary these days compared to what it used to be. They used to do these complex like MR, MRI scans. Um, and these and these whole like DNA analyses and trying to find the gene that would make you a good greengrocer or a good lifeguard or whatever. Um, and um, and they did the analysis and they said, listen, Swift, um, your designated career that we've assigned to you in this dystopic future um, is you're going to be a snowboard instructor. Um, but here's the thing: at the time when I got that that snowboard instruction designation, I was living in um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, and it's really hard to make a living as a snowboard instructor in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, let me tell you, um, you actually can apply a lot of the same principles to dune surfing, um, as it happens. Uh, if you get like a nice smooth bit of um, or even like cardboard or something. Like if you just strap a flat surface to your feet, you can you can catch some mad rip curl tides, mate. It, it's tubular, mate. Uh, surfing dunes in Africa, um, and so I enjoyed that a long time. But uh, but my career as a snowboard instructor was short lived. I'll say that much. Um, also, like you know you know oh you know what's fucking cool. Uh, let me. Oh, what's the word? Um, I can't remember the word. Someone tell me in the chat, what's the word for when lightning strikes a desert and hits sand or dirt and the heat of the lightning strike um, melts and, 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 like, fuses the sand and the dirt into, like, a glass-like rock material, like a kind of a stone? I'm sure someone can tell me in the chat that there's, there's a word for, 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 the, for the rock, the kind of mineral thing that results from lightning striking sand it's the coolest thing ever um and yeah like yeah glassification there's a specific word for the kind of like um material result um but apparently one of the upsides of, of, of nuking um deserts um if you ever if you ever try that um is is the idea that you might end up with a glass crater and then maybe you could skateboard on that Fulgurite, Jack Clark says. Yeah, fulgurite. That's what I was thinking. Um, it, it, fulgurite is the is the rocky, stony material that results in uh, lightning strikes onto sand. Cool shit. Um, but but what I was trying to say was that if we find like a desert planet like Arrakis out there somewhere, I think that what we should do is is nuke it a lot um, because then we'd end up with all these glass craters like these perfectly smooth glass bowls this is science guy this is exactly what would happen these these perfectly smooth glass craters on this on this planet and then it would become a skate park planet um because you'd have all these awesome like smooth surfaces um actually maybe that'd be shit for skateboarding my skateboarding career was also pretty short-lived um 
because I got I got um I got I fell off the skateboard um and 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 snapped all my spines um uh and and the, and the rehab it was a whole thing I, I, I you can see it in my biopic um but anyway so that's that's um that's what this chapter is about anyway Sansa one a clash of kings uh so Tommen and Joffrey uh, uh are all hanging about uh Joffrey sucks Tommen rules um and and Joffrey dismisses Tommen and dismisses Aris Okart and Joffrey studies Sansa from head to heels. Um, he, he seems like some kind of scientician um, with a with a bug on the end of a pin or something. You know, he's examining her in I think quite a cold, dehumanizing way. Um, like um, oh, the the male gaze. That's what they call it, isn't it? He's fucking looking at her like a object, like a like a store mannequin. And he's critically thinking. Mm, I think you should have more, more, more of that and less of that. And, and it's and it's gross. Um, and 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 that's something that Sansa has to play along with to survive. Like she's always thinking about like um, you know what to wear and how to cover up her bruises with her long sleeves. Sansa Sansa almost has to participate in her own dehumanization in order to survive, which is which is a bit fucked. Um, and, and he tells her to sit. He commands her to sit. He treats her like a dog. Um, Diana Rook says, undressing her with his eyes. I, I think it's not even that. Like, I don't think Joffrey, like, I don't think Joffrey wants Sansa in, like, a sexual way or anything. I think it's really just about control and power and, 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 and causing pain with him. Um, I'm sure someone could write a very in-depth and and uncomfortable essay about Joffrey and sexuality um because I don't think he really has much sexuality I mean he's quite young he's 13 um I mean there was that scene in the show where like you know he he, he abuses those prostitutes and stuff which isn't in the books um but um but yeah something something Fremen something something Bene Gesserit um <laughs> English lit Every lens is a feminist lens, says Smashed Avo. Um, I was a- I was a- I was actually one of the f- one of the world's few um, uh, feminist uh, glass bowl alien planet skateboarders. It was a pretty it was a pretty narrow niche, but I really I really owned that niche. I think I was the best feminist glass bowl skateboarder. Anyway, um, so. Joffrey mentions that the beggar king is dead. And for a moment, uh, Sansa's horrified. She thinks, oh my god, the beggar king is dead. Does he mean Rob? Uh, but actually, Joffrey means Viserys Targaryen, Daenerys's brother, who's just been crowned with molten gold. Um, which, uh, which Joffrey thinks is hilarious. Joffrey has a really bad sense of humor. You know the thing about bad guys? You know, you know what's... It, it's absolutely true in the real world. Like dictators and 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 assholes, they they have a bad sense of humor. I, I I honestly think that like like being like yeah, well that's a boring tangent. But like like jo- Joffrey doesn't know what's funny is all I'm trying to say. Um oh and Joffrey's like oh by the way you know and I'm gonna kill your brother Rob as well. <laughs> so Rob so Joffrey's really um. Uh, trying to provoke Sansa and being uh, quite horrible. And he says to Sansa, oh, I intend to challenge Rob to single combat. Um, did you know that? I'm going to fight your brother Rob. Which which, which raises the question, I think, is Joffrey dumb? Like, really, really dumb? Um, yeah, no, yeah, no, that, yeah, that, I think that's what I was sort of getting at, Advar, which is that humour, I think, I think it does, it, it, it relates to compassion and I think it relates to a capacity to like see things from different perspectives. I I think being funny is is often a sign of being like a good person. What well, it's like a you know what what like what are those like any b- bad tangent. But um so Ro- so Joffrey's like I'm going to fight your brother Rob. It's going to be great. I'm going to stick him with the pointy end. Um and and Sansa thinks, "Oh, I should like to see that, your grace." more than you know. So Sansa is subtly implying that she would love to see Joffrey fight Rob, um, because Rob would kick his ass. Um, and so Sansa keeps her tone cool and polite, but Joffrey, um, can detect that she's mocking him. So Sansa, 
is trying to fight back and resist as best um, as she can here. Um, but in the same way that the best armor that she's got is a silk gown, the best weapon that she's got is um, subtle sarcasm and criticism. Um, I, I, th I think Sansa's arc is a great comparison to Arya's arc. Like, in a lot of ways, they're going through the same thing. Like, right now, at the same time that Sansa is having to pretend to be loyal to Joffrey and having to, to bite her tongue, Arya is having to pretend to be a boy, and she's having to repress her own true identity. Um, the, the, the arcs are very parallel and very similar, um, even at the same time that they're very different. Like, you know, Sansa's best weapon is cool, polite words. Arya's best weapon is a fucking needle. Um, but the, the, the strong similarities in how they're just trying to survive and they've got to pretend to be someone else in order to do it. Um, and, um, uh, and Joffrey's like, oh, and I'm going to win this tournament or, you know, well, well, Joffrey isn't fighting in the tournament, but he says that like, well, if I was fighting in this tournament, I would, um, I would totally win, man. I'm the best. I just beat everyone. Um, and, and Joffrey's like, isn't that right, Sandor? Isn't that right, Hound? I would totally beat everyone. And, and Sandor's response is, against this lot? Why not? So he's saying, like, that the, the competition is so poor in this particular tourney that Joffrey may well could... What the f... May well could? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'm having a stroke. Um, he, he pro... He may, he may... Did you ever have a, a dream that was not be, be like it, it was, but it d doesn't? No. Um, so Sandor's like, uh, yeah, you could, phew, against this sh crappy competition, you probably could win. Um, and I think there's just a great moment of Sandor just giving zero fucks. Um, although, uh, shortly after, Joffrey's like, well, do you, th uh, do you think you're going to win, Sandor? Um, if you fought in this tournament? And, and Sandor's voice is thick with contempt, and he says, it wouldn't be worth trying. So I think I think that I think that's kind of a less cool moment actually to be hypercritical for a moment because like when Sandor says you beat this lot why not like that's great because that's Sandor giving zero fucks but then when um, Joffrey asks if Sandor would win it seems like he legitimately like actually cares he, he his voice is thick with contempt he actually like thinks that oh I'm so much better than these other dickheads which which is kind of the opposite of giving zero fucks it, it sounds like Sandor actually cares about his like superiority here which I think it's a bit sad um that I, I, I don't know I, I, I just like Sandor better when he when he gives no fucks than when he does but you know maybe I mean it's humanizing to give fucks why is fuck giving th the best term we can come up with here anyway so um so Joffrey talks about how um, he wants to make some people fight to the death because Joffrey is a dickhead and he likes making people fight to the death. Uh, I think he's, like, one of those, like, really sadistic kids who, like, plays Sims and just makes the Sims, like, drown in the pool and, 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 and contract, um, uh, e um, eczema. Um, that's, uh, uh, anyway, so, uh, so Joffrey holds Sansa's hand and Sansa thinks, once that would have set my heart to pounding, I would have been all a flutter with butterflies in my uterus. Um, but these days, uh, not so. Uh, Sansa hates Joffrey holding her hand because, uh, Joffrey is the man who presented her with her father's head and his touch fills her with revulsion, uh, revulsion which she cannot show. There's lots of parallels here to, like, um, domestic abuse sort of situations, obviously, uh, in which women, or not women, I guess, people are stuck in a situation with some kind of um, in a relationship with someone who has more power than them and in a situation that they feel they cannot escape and in a situation where they have to hold their tongue, suppress their emotions in order to survive, um, which is a very real situation for a lot of people, obviously. Um... <laughs> Amy Bennett says that the UK KFC had a chicken shortage and she blames Sandor. I think I think Sandor is responsible for a lot of economic problems um, in the UK, actually. Brexit, I'm actually going to pin Brexit on the hound. I think he was behind that whole fucking thing. Um, I, th but that's, that's another video. We're, we're going to go into a deep analysis of that one day. Um, uh, congratulations for winning bingo as well. Kelly. Apparently there's an Alt Swift X bingo. Uh which which <laughs> which yeah, I can't imagine. Anyway, um uh wh what are we doing? Oh, Game of Thrones. Okay. So, um so Meryn Trant turns up. Meryn Trant is one of those characters who got fucking uh, poorly adapted in the show, I I think, in my opinion. Um 
uh, because in season five of Game of Thrones, Meryn Trant turns up at Bravos um, and he gets assassinated by Arya, which is like, okay, fine. Um, but the prelude to Meryn's assassination is characterizing Meryn as the most morally repugnant, un-fucking-forgivable uh, monster possible because they have this whole this whole sequence of Meryn, like, going to a brothel and wanting to have sex with children, like, little girls, and, like, beating them. So, like, he's not only, like, a, like, pedophile, rapist, uh, sadomasochist, um, he, he, he beats little girls, then rapes them, which is, which is just the, the most heavy-handed way to make Meryn Trant a villain, and therefore to strip Arya's assassination of Meryn of any kind of moral ambiguity, right? Like, the, uh, what's fascinating about Aya's arc, uh, or, or, or part of what's fascinating about Aya's arc, is that sh- is that she's a hero who does bad things. Um, I like like we sympathize with Aya, but but like she kills like semi innocent people, which I think is really fucked up. But but the show strips away that moral ambiguity by making Meryn a cartoonishly evil dude um, before he dies, which I think sucks. It would have been better. Like, instead of having that child-beating scene, they should have had a scene of Meryn, like, like, looking at a locket of, of his, of his, of his, well, not his wife, but, but, but if they had a humanizing moment where they showed Meryn Trant, like, cares about things, maybe Meryn Trant has secretly been learning how to play the violin in his spare time. He's a sensitive boy deep down, and he's got some kind of passion, and he's got some kind of hobby. Maybe Meryn Trant has a pet canary who he, like, feeds giblets and is teaching how to sing, um, Kentucky, um, uh, what we're getting at is it would be cool if Meryn Trant was, like, humanized before he was killed, because then that would actually make his death interesting. Um, anyway. Uh, Meryn tr- saving a puppy. Yeah, that's a good idea, Edvar. Meryn should have, like, um, rescued a puppy from being, like, drowned in a Bravosi canal. Meryn should have leapt into the canal, um, despite wearing full plate armor, and heroically rescued, like, an entire litter of adorable... Dalmatian puppy dogs, and then he would have said, "I'm going to start a Dalmatian puppy dog uh, orphanage for for every Dalmatian puppy dog in the world." And I'm going to, uh, and uh, well, that might be a little bit too much, but I'd watch that. I'd watch like a Disney um, uh, cartoon of of Marin Trance Dalmatian puppy orphanarium. Um, that should be a YouTube channel. Uh, so then we have the first joust in this tourney. Uh, Meryn Trant faces off against Sir Hobber of House Redwine. Horror, as he's called. Uh, twin to uh, Slobber. Um, and um, and they joust and they hit each other with sticks and it's exciting. Is it just me or is jousting like a shitty um, sport? I, well, you know, we'll get to that. Uh, Stephanie points out that armor doesn't make you sink, ask Jamie, which is yet yeah, another one of those hilarious um, ridiculous things that happens in the show, which is that every time someone falls into water in full plate, um, they just magically survive. Jamie falls into water in episode, uh, what is it, f- uh, three of season six, um, and 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 the and and the full plate steel serves as like a flotation device, which miraculously saves Jamie. Um, so it, I think characters are distinctly more safe under ten feet of water than they are above it. Um, Alexander Velisky is having a um, social, a Venezuelan socialism chat uh, in the chat, um, which, 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 you know, I'm glad. I'm glad someone's sorting that out. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, so Marin Trant beats um, Red Wine, and it's a dumb sport. Like hitting, like it's not even like, like the the like. First of all, it's expensive. Like, you, like, do you know how much horses cost? Like horses, you gotta like feed them, and you gotta like give them fancy new hooves, and you gotta teach them how to read, and like hooves, like horses are a big responsibility. Um, so that sucks. Um, the the lances, like there's like these massive like twelve foot long lances that are designed to break. That's a massive waste of wood. Don't these Westerosi have any appreciation for deforestation? The orangutans, tangs, man, orang orangutans. Um, they haven't got any trees to swing around on because all these fucking Westerosi are cutting them down to make jousting lances. That's so irresponsible. Um, for the sake of the orangutans, stop jousting. Um, and, and the, it's, it's, and the danger, like, humans, people get killed 
jousting. Isn't that? Wouldn't that just be the worst way to joust? Like, imagine going up to the pearly gates or whatever gates you prefer. You know, going for a swim in the sticks, and 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 you meet the god of death, and the god says, "Hey, uh, so uh, how do you die?" I mean, I mean, that's actually what heaven would be like. It would just be a bunch of of disembodied souls standing around, just making like awkward s- small talk for for ten million years, and, and and obviously the first thing you'd ask when you meet another condemned soul in limbo is you'd say so it'd be like prison like in prison you go up to your inmate or at least that's how it was when i was imprisoned in guatemala um in the in the 1880s um uh, you, you go up to someone and say hey so like you know what are you in for that's always the line what are you in for what was your crime like like in prison people people's identity is defined by the crime that landed them in prison and in the afterlife people's identity is defined by the death that brought them to the afterlife. It's the same logic. And so the first thing you'd ask to someone in the afterlife would be, so, how'd you die? What are you in for? Um, And, you know, some people would have great answers. Like, you know, Steve Irwin can say, I got stabbed through the heart by a stingray. Like, Jesus Christ, is that not the best thing you could possibly say? Um, Or, like, what are some other great famous deaths? Um, uh, Fucking... Um, people who died trying to invent flight. You know, there are people who died trying to invent flight. Amelia Earhart. Get, I, I was crossing the globe in my biplane, and 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 I, I, I died of exposure because I was so brave that I, that I fucking, I was killed by God. For, like Amelia Earhart is like the modern day Icarus who just flew too high in her biplane and died as a result. That is a great answer to the question of how did you die? And the bad um the bad uh thing. What am I saying? <laughs> so that that is what happens in the afterlife is you is you is you say what were you in for what killed you? And so, fucking Sir Hugh of the Veil. <laughs> Sir Hugh of the Veil Everyone's like chatting about all the cool shit that killed them in the afterlife. And someone asks, so, Sir Hugh, what are you in for? You're a knight, Sir Hugh. You, you must have been like out trying to like, you know, vanquish the evil and protect the innocent. Like, Sir Hugh, you must have been such a cool guy in life. And Sir Hugh has to say, I was stabbed in the neck with a stick because I was charging at that stick on a horse, face first, um, for the noble cause of trying to hit another man with a stick like it's all it's all sticks it sticks all the way down H- how like no one no one wins in a stick on stick situation like it's all sticks um so <laughs> so like like where's there's like the ideal situation the absolute best outcome of a joust is that is that you start with two sticks you end up with one stick or or zero sticks even it's just i'm not very interested in sticks that's all i'm trying to say um all right apparently um wet dick daddy says that emily earhart had a twin engine monoplane oh okay my apologies i got some amelia earhart facts wrong uh we've learned a new fact apparently uh amelia earhart had a monoplane with a twin engine. I actually have no idea what that means. Biplane uh, means two of something, right? So does a biplane have two propellers or does it have like two layers of wings? Is that it? Um, aero, aeronautic engineering has changed a bit since I was in the industry. Um, there's a lot more, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot less flapping these days, actually. When, when I was in the, the aerospace industry, there, were, there was much more flapping. It was all about, people took the idea of wings a lot more literally um back then um feathers as well uh tarring and feathering was like the 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 cutting edge of aeronautical engineering um which um ended badly for my cousin uh that 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 was that was rough that was rough on her uh anyway um so jousting is dumb um and so uh so hobber gets defeated by fucking marin trant uh, and he doesn't do a very good job of, of stick sticking fighting sticks, um, and he falls off his horse. And then King Joffrey, the the protector of the seven kingdoms, the 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 the, the God's representative on earth, um, says um, <laughs> King Joffrey says poorly ridden. 
You're a shitlord, Hobber. You can't even stick sticks stickily, man. What are you sticking? Um, you ain't shit, says King Joffrey. Which, which hardly seems like a, like the right thing for a, for a king or a lord to do. It's not very dignified for you to go around telling random people whether they're, whether they're hot shit or not. That hardly seems like a regal thing to do. Not to get too topical, but like, if, a, if, if, for instance, a president, uh, went around, uh, issuing <coughs> commentary on, like, who was and was not hot shit, like, if, if, say, a, a, a president... Uh, was like, oh, you're you're a you're a creaky old man with who can't hold a bottle of water. Like that would not be a very dignified thing for a leader to do. It would not seem very becoming. Uh, although then again, like, what is becomingness anyway? Maybe there are things more important than becomingness. Um, but but anyway, um, so w- Moros of Hound Slint, House Slint, uh, is one of the next. Um, is one of the next... Man, there's a lot of caps lock in the chat at the moment. I'm not sure why. Um, and Moros Slint is the son of Janos Slint. Janos Slint is, of course, um, the uh, man who helped betray Ned Stark. Uh, he pretended to be on Ned Stark's side with the gold cloaks, but then he survived. Um, he, he, he betrayed Ned and helped uh, Cersei and Littlefinger instead. Um, and, and everyone laughs at Moros for being an up-jumped, um, an ump-jumped oaf, they call him, um, because he's not from a noble family, he's, he hasn't got blue blood, he's just some, like, random peasant, basically, um, a mere squire, and he's trying to be knightly, and he's not doing a very good job of it, and Sansa thinks, I hope that he falls and shames himself, I hope Sir Balon kills him. So it's understanding that, yeah, understandable that Sansa is really mad at, at, at the slints, for their role in betraying Ned, but I mean, Moros is probably innocent, right? Like, and it's a bit fucked up for Sansa to wish death on young on young Moros, given that like he he probably has never hurt anyone as far as we know. So it's pretty rough to like wish death on him, but whatever. Um, oh, and by the way, the Slints have a bloody spear as their sigil, which again seems odd, um, because, like, the bloody spear represents, like, the, the, the stabbing of, of, of Ned Stark and whatever, like, like, the betrayal of, of, of the Starks, which seems like something you, you wouldn't want to advertise. Like, why would you have a symbol of your own treachery and moral paucity as, as your logo? Like, it's like if Exxon Mobil had, like, a, like a, like a dead penguin coated in oil <laughs> as their sigil. That's not really something you'd want to advertise, you know? Um, so, that, that's an odd choice. Um, although maybe it's, like, the Bolton thing, where the Boltons have, like, the flayed man as their, as their sigil to say, like, you don't want to fuck with us, because, because we party with, with knives. Um, uh, so maybe they're trying to intimidate people, um, with their bloody spear, maybe that's the idea. Um, Bram VDS points out that it's quite ironic, uh, to have a bloody spear for a sigil, and be terrible at jousting. Well, well, maybe they're rubbish with jousting lances, but maybe Moros is is specifically trained in in the in the little known art of bloody spear jousting. Maybe he's good with a bloody spear, but not with a jousting lance. Um, and um, so uh, Moros uh, fails in the joust. His head bounces along the ground as he gets dragged by his horse because he gets half knocked off the horse which can kill you by the way um heads uh, and 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 horses and 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 ground bad combination bad recipe um and Sansa is appalled wondering if the gods had heard her vengeful prayer so I hope that Sansa is at least to some extent at this moment maybe a little bit regretful of wishing death on him uh I hope um so long Angela Smith um, and Tommen says, oh, uh, Joffrey says that, oh, Tommen, you should have fought bloody Moros, he's even worse than the bloody stuffed, uh, straw knight who you're gonna fight. Uh, and then Horus Redwine fights and makes a poor contest of it and no one's very impressed. Um, and so Joffrey is by, is becoming bored as a result of this poor show. Um, and... And it's making Sansa anxious because she knows that when Joffrey is bored, uh, he might become dangerous and violent. So Sansa has to constantly monitor and manage the emotional fucking instability of this of this psychotic little little shit stain, um, which is a hell of a fucking job to have when you're a what? How old is Sansa? Like a twelve year old girl? Fourteen? That's a lot of responsibility. Um, and she tr- and she lowers her eyes and resolves to keep quiet no matter what. 
So Sansa has to constantly belittle herself and, and, and restrict herself and, and, and hide her truth in order to survive, which is um, fucked. Uh, Lothor Brun and Sir Dontos the Red fight. Uh, well, Lothor Brun turns up, but Sir Dontos arrives uh, cursing and staggering and drunk and naked. He's wearing a breastplate and a plumed helm and nothing else. His manhood flops about obscenely. Um, and... And this for me is a moment like like what's that like you know when the show like does like the record scratch you're probably wondering how I ended up here like I'd love to have that for Sir Dontos like how exactly um did Sir Dontos end up in this situation how did how did Sir Dontos end up mostly naked at a joust like he did he leave home without those pants or like I'm assuming or maybe he was in like the he was in, like, the change rooms for, like, the jousters. He was in, like, the, the whatever stable they keep their jousters in. Um, but, like, he misplaced his pants? Was he, like, was he, like, having sex? Or, like, pissing? Or, like, and then someone, like, stole his pants? Like, where, how, how did he lose his pants? I've got so many Sir Dontos questions. Yeah, The, the Hangover Part 4 Sir Dontos Edition, Bram VDS says. I would love to watch that film. Um, I'd love to know what sort of uh, alcohol-fueled uh, exploits Sir Dantos got onto that led him to this moment. Um, I'd love to know. Uh, well, if you want to go back, it started at Duskendale, Stephanie Morris points out. Because Sir Dantos, well, it, 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 yeah, which is very true. Because Sir Dantos, um descends from House um, Hollard, which was involved with the, was it the Darklands at Duskendale, who like defied... They actually captured King Ares, which was a terrible idea. And so, like, Ares, like, condemned and, and, and executed, like, the, the entire family. Like, all of Sidondos' family was killed by um, the Targaryens after after what they did to Ares. Um, and Sidondos was the only survivor, thanks to the mercy of Sir Barristan, it was. Sir Barristan saved Ares, and Sir Barristan is like, um, uh, well, you know, please, you know... I, I, as a as a favor for what I did to save Ares, uh, please spare this boy Dontos. Don't kill him. Um, and Dontos, it looks like, has uh, relied on alcohol to get over some of the trauma of the death of his family, perhaps. Um, but still, he should have worn pants. Uh, life life tips from Ultra Dex. We need to, we need to just give like a life li life uh, self improvement uh, pro tips life hacks podcast uh and the first one is um in most situations wear pants or at least have the option of pants or just some kind of some anyway um so so Dontos is naked and everyone's laughing but Joffrey is not is not Im is not amused he is not the queen is not amused uh and so Joffrey's like I'm gonna drown so Dontos in wine he's drunk he's a dickhead so I'm gonna drown so Dontos in wine um and Sansa gasps and says no you can't. It would be so horrible to kill Sir Dontos. Sansa, Sansa has compassion for this, uh, for this um, pantsless knight, uh, and and wants him to not be killed. Which is interesting, given that Sansa literally just wished death on 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 what's his name, Slint, Moros Slint. I mean, maybe part of why Sansa is so compassionate for Dontos in that moment is is partly like a like a guilty reaction to wishing death on Moros and then having Moros injured. Maybe that's what this is. But for whatever reason, Sansa has a, has a, has a rush of courage and compassion and, and stands up for Sir Dontos. And she realizes that what she's doing is incredibly fucking dangerous, questioning Joffrey in front of everyone when Joffrey is so dangerous and cruel. Um, and Sansa has to quickly think of an excuse and she has to sort of talk her way out of it. But, but, she, but she still manages to, to advocate for Dontos's life in front of everyone, which is a very brave thing to do. And, and, and there's also an obvious you know, commentary here. And, and, and Sandor helps her, by the way. Sandor like, backs up what, Sandor's, what Sansa says and like, helps uh, Dontos to not be killed. Um, which, um, which is obviously commentary on the whole sort of like knightliness versus... Um, you know, idealisticness versus whatever, B because like we're surrounded by knights here, right? We're surrounded by like Kingsguard and all of these knights who are jousting, all of whom are sworn to protect the innocent and uh, uphold justice and whatever. And and yet, the only two people who stand up for protecting the life of Dantos Hollard are Sansa and Sandor, who aren't knights. Sandor is 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 one of the few non-knight warriors, and Sansa's a young girl. 
and yet they are the only two people with with the courage and with the with the ethics to stand up and protect Dantos Holard, um, which is obviously a, a, a big criticism of the idea of knighthood and the corruption of this idea of knighthood and how people aren't living up to that ideal. Um, so, um, so Sansa basically says that, oh, you know, you should let D Dontos survive and, and you should keep him as your jester instead of killing him. Um, so we managed to, uh, save Dontos by making a jester. And of course, Dontos later plays a role in getting Sansa out of King's Landing, uh, because Dontos works for Littlefinger. I wonder if he works for Littlefinger even at this point, or if that comes later. Um, I don't, I don't I'm not sure we know. Um, and... Uh, Joffrey complains about about wanting to put people to death, um, and then Joffrey calls off the tournament because it's such a shit show. But Tommen says no, but I want to joust. Mother said I could joust, um, and Marcella and Marcella agrees with Tommen, and it's just great seeing Marcella and Tommen uh, fight for their rights against Joffrey. I mean, it, I mean, it's such a crazy you know contrast that like you know Joffrey's literally out here like executing people left, right, and center like it ain't no thing. And meanwhile, like Marcella and Tommen are just witnessing it all these young children, and they still manage to be so just, like, sort of nice kids, you know, despite all the horror happening around them. Uh, they manage to not follow Joffrey's terrible example. Um, and, um, and Marcella drops her, we're supposed to be childish thing, um, and, and eventually Joffrey allows Tommen to go and do his jousting, and he's very excited, his chubby little legs pumping hard as he runs off to get ready for the joust, um, and his opponent is a child-sized leather warrior, a straw knight, and it wears antlers on its head. Um, and Sansa notes that, you know, antlers are obviously a symbol of House Baratheon, and so it's interesting that you have the Lannisters, you know, symbolically killing, defeating uh, Baratheons here. Especially since, you know, when Tom and jousts, he shouts, Castly Rock, instead of shouting, say, Storm's End or the Red Keep, because, you know, Tommen is supposedly a Baratheon, right? as much as he is a Lannister, and yet, um, he's shouting Castly Rock, um, in the same way that, you know, the comet is red, not, not gold, um, so, so all of this is sort of symbolically alluding to the fact that, um, that Tommen and Joffrey and Marcella are not really, uh, Baratheons, um, and, and, and Tommen's outfit is, is, is fucking sharp as hell, like, he's really bringing his Bruce, blue steel game, um, here, because he's got an ornate silver and crimson armor and a tall plume of red feathers, which would look so funny on a tiny little kid like Tommen. Um, eight, eight year old kid. Remember when, like, um, Mace Tyrell in season six of Game of Thrones has that great hat with the big plume of feathers? Um, it would be even, it would be even funnier, uh, on an eight year old boy, I think. Um, all right. And so Tommen goes and charges against his straw knight, and it's a pretty intense competition, guys. Like this is this is this is a real clash of the titans, um, Tommen versus the straw knight. Um, and in the end, it's it's a it's a close fought battle, but the straw knight is the victor. Uh, Tommen hits the stra the 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 leather mannequin knight, um, and and the knight and it spins around on an on an axis, and and the straw knight hits Tommen back and knocks Tommen off his horse. So Tommen is is defeated in the joust by the straw knight, um, the straw man, uh, uh, which is, which is you know, that's just how competition goes in sports ball sometimes. Um, and, uh, and he gets knocked down and people laugh um, and Marcella scrambles to help Tommen. Uh, so Marcella and Tommen have a nice sibling bond um, looking after each other. Um, but Joffrey does nothing but laugh at his fallen... Um, his fallen brother and Sansa, possessed with a queer, giddy courage, says, "You should go with her. You should, you should go look after Tom, and he's your brother, you twat. Like, go and be nice to your brother and help him. He might be hurt." Um, and uh, because he's like, "Oh, Tom might be hurt," and Joffrey says, oh, "I don't care. What if he is hurt?" Um, so Joffrey's Joffrey has no fucking human sympathy. Uh, and we 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 knew that. Um, and then the Hound says, but look, Tommen, the boy has courage. He's going to try again because Tommen wants to ride again. Um, <laughs> Isaac says that the legendary Straw Knight remains undefeated. This, this Straw Knight is like some kind of like anime villain 
um, who 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 is who is renowned for for his martial skill. There's no fear in a straw man. You ever notice that you can't there's you, you can't like freak out a straw man. You can't play mind games with a straw man. You can't intimidate a straw man. You can't outsmart a straw man. A straw man has nothing but 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 patience and grit and and stamina. A straw man never gets exhausted. A straw man is the ultimate warrior, and I think Tommen bravely fought against this straw man. Um, and so and so Sandor again, like with his words, steps in to sort of support Sansa. Like like you know when when Sansa was trying to save Sir Dontos, Sandor steps in to help. When um, Sansa tries to get Joffrey to help Tommen, Sandor steps in and and, and supports her. Um, so Sandor is very, is very consciously and very deliberately out there to help Sansa. He obviously feels, um, a connection to her just as she does to him increasingly later on. Sandor and Sansa are obviously one of the more interesting relationships in the series, um, which we'll talk about later in Clash, I'm sure. And Sansa also thinks that, man, Tommen really is like a decent kid, isn't he? I wouldn't mind marrying Tommen, Sansa says, which, which, like... I, I ship that. I totally ship Sansa X Tommen because that because like Sa- like it'd be great. Sansa could handle all of the like politics shit, and you know she 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 could have space to sort of grow and learn and be better at what she's doing. Tommen could handle all of the um, kittens and the stamping. Um, it would all be it would all go great, and you'd, you'd have to deal with none of this like abuse, horrible violence that happens between Sansa. Um, and Joffrey. I mean, you know, I mean, hanging around in King's Landing would obviously be awful still. Um, but Sansa Tommen, that'd be great. That'd be such an improvement. Um, I, I ship that. Uh, anyway, so, uh, riders arrive. They come through the gate. They arrive at the Red Keep. It's a bunch of Lannister soldiers and a bunch of random free riders and sellswords and a bunch of monstrous savages, Sansa sees clad in skins and leather, some of them missing eyes, ears, and fingers. So these are the burned men who, who burn off bits of their body for kicks. Um, and, uh, and, and I would love, like, like these are the mountain clansmen from, from the mountains of the moon, obviously, uh, who Tyrion has recruited. Um, and I would, I would love to know what the experience of these clansmen is in King's Landing. So th- these are guys who are living in the, the mountains they're surviving off like goats and cello tape like the, like they they have a pretty like limited scope of the world in their lives right like the most exciting thing that happens um in their lives is like when like a fucking uncle sven finds like like a, a, a rat with two heads is like that they talk about that for weeks there's not a lot going on in the mountains of the moon and yet these random unwashed clansmen come to King's Landing, one of the largest cities in in Westeros. The largest city in Westeros is Old Town. I don't know, big city. Um, it, it'd be it'd be like fucking Crocodile Dundee too. It'd be like the, the the bloody like outback, no nonsense rural people coming to the big city and trying to navigate. Like you can imagine, you know, Timmet, son of Timmet, walking down Gin Alley, saying, you know, get eight, get eight. How's it going to every bloke walking down the street? I, I, I would watch the shit out of that movie, like Timmet versus Timmet versus King's Landing. Just, just, just all the, just all of the, all of the mischief that you'd get up to, would be great. Um, I'd watch that movie. Um, and uh, Tyrion is there, and Tyrion has let his beard grow, a great yellow bristle tangle, uh, coarse as wire. Uh, that covers up a bunch of his face. I reckon Peter Dinklage should have grown out his beard at some point in Game of Thrones. That would have looked great, uh, but alas, he does not. And he's also wearing a shadow skin cloak. Uh, so Tyrion is learning to accessorize. I reckon the fashion in this, um, the fashion in this chapter is great. I think I think in, in all chapters that don't contain a food description, and there are some, uh, the the fashion description sort of uh, plays the same role. So Tyrion arrives, and he's very ugly. Sansa is very. Um, put off by how ugly Tyrion is so like you know she is starting to question the whole sort of you know realities beneath the false appearances but Sansa is still very much conscious and put off by Tyrion's ugliness Um, and of course Tyrion is far more ugly in the books than he is in the show Um, and Tommen and Marcella rush to greet Tyrion and there is yeah there is a really adorable great relationship between Tyrion uh, and his 
uh, niece and nephew, Marcella and Tom. And uh, they really love each other and they're laughing and hugging and the dwarf picks Marcella up by the waist and spins her around in a circle and they're having uh, a lovely reunion. They have sort of a similar moment uh, in this scene in season two, um, but it's not... It's it, it, There isn't as much emphasis on it. We see very little of... Um, Tom and, and Marcella in the early seasons and of course they get recast for the later seasons um, which I think is a shame because they are great characters to have around um, Anand Mishra uh, uh, points out that Tyrion does have a beard um, in later seasons, true but here he has a really like wild bushy beard um, which I think uh, suits the cut of his jib very much um, Tyrion is the best uncle ever says Diana, I would love to have Tyrion as an uncle he would be great. And I think I think Tyrion comes from a long line of great uncles as well, doesn't he? Because uh, Tyrion had his uncle Garion and and his uncle Tig as well. Like, yeah, Tyrion had great uncles. And maybe that was a sort of uncle role model uh, that, that helped Tyrion be a good uncle to Missella and, and uh, Tommen. I wonder if, um, I wonder if Garion had a great uncle. Um, who was... Did, did, did Titos... Lannister Tyr Tywin's father have brothers? I don't know. Um, so, there's probably a family tree in the World of Ice and Fire, isn't there? Um, anyway, so um, so Tyrion turns up uh, and he reunites with his uh, nephew and niece um, and he's accompanied by Timot, son of Timot, and Bronn um, and he kneels before the king and the king is rude to Tyrion. Uh, Joffrey really hates Tyrion. Um, and... And Tyrion antagonizes the Hound a bit. Like, the Hound says to Tyrion, oh, they said you were dead. Uh, and Tyrion says, I was speaking to the king, not to you, you bloody woofer, you bloody bork dog. I'm not talking to you. So so Tyrion, this is something, like, Tyrion really, like, Tyrion always complains that, like, oh, everyone hates me because I'm a dwarf. Everyone's mean to me all the time. Tyrion is mean to people all the time. Tyrion is really dismissive and rude and superior to a lot of people all the time. Um, and, and I, I think he shouldn't be. I, I think Tyrion, I, I guess it's like a superiority issue. I guess it's like a masculinity issue. I guess it's like Tyrion tries to sort of assert himself and tries to like be dominant to try and make up for his being a dwarf and his being looked down on by a lot of people. But I really don't think that Tyrion does himself any favors by being rude to people like Sandor. Um, Princess Marcella says, I'm glad you're not dead, Uncle Tyrion. Um, and, um... And Tyrion says, "Me too." Um, although, actually, uh, in the well, in the show, Tyrion, I believe, just says, "Me too." But in the books, Tyrion says, "We share that view, sweet child," which, which I think is an example of like, like they use this sort of like old timey language in um, in the books a lot, or like overly ornate, you know, verbose language in the books a lot, which I think is dumb sometimes. Um, uh, I mean, hot take, but I'm kind of a fan of, like, effective, concise communication. <laughs> and uh, and there's a lot of not that in Game of Thrones. Um, the show, for reasons of, you know, runtime and whatever, is often a lot more straightforward and concise in the language, which, which makes it easier to follow, which I think is a good thing. I enjoy the flowery language in the book sometimes, um, but, um, but I don't know, I think in this case it's a bit much. Um... And, you know, I'm not praising the writing of the book, of the show too much, because that's the same show that later has Tyrion say, if I ever do something that stupid again, punch me in the face. Which I think is, it was, that was just the moment that, like, Jesus Christ, that was a bad line. Anyway, um, and so, uh, Joffrey, uh, Tyrion says that he's sorry, uh, for Joffrey's, oh, well, well, first of all, Tyrion says he's sorry for Sansa's loss, for the loss of his father, of her father, Ned, um, and Sansa's response is suspicion. Is Tyrion mocking her, she thinks? So Tyrion's trying to be nice to Sansa, he's, um, and yet uh, Sansa is too suspicious of him. I wonder to what extent that's because of his ugliness. I wonder if Sansa is suspicious of Tyrion because he's so ugly. Uh, I think that might be part of it. Uh, but then Tyrion also says, uh, Oh, Joffrey, I'm sorry for your loss. And Joffrey's like, what loss? <laughs> and, and Tyrion's like, your father, Robert Baratheon? You know, the big bloke with the beard? I'm sure you'll remember him if you think hard. Um, and, and Joffrey's like, oh, him, yes, well, it was very sad, a boar killed him. So Joffrey really just does not give any fucks about the death of his father, 
uh, which does seem very sociopathic and nasty. Although at the same time, there was that moment of Joffrey seeking approval from Robert Baratheon when we're later told um, we're later told that Joffrey tried to kill Bran uh, in order to try to oppress Robert. So, so Joffrey obviously had some kind of emotional connection with Robert, um, but um, yeah, not much of one in the end. Um, Cult Swift X, Hadass says. That's uh, th- that's that might be closer to the truth, eh? That's a good name, Cult Swift X. Or or, or or there could be maybe um, Cult Shift X, which could be like a series explaining cults. That would also be exciting. So we need to think of more good spin-off shows. I think that's uh, I think that's a good one. Um, Amy Bennett says, where we all get matching tattoos. Actually, the first person to get an Alt Drift X tattoo, oh, man, that would actually be so fucking cool. I mean, I wouldn't, rec- I wouldn't recommend it, strictly speaking. Like, I don't know what an Alt Drift X tattoo would do to your employment prospects. I wouldn't get it on, I wouldn't get it anywhere too visible. But if someone got an Alt Drift X tattoo, I mean, I, look, I would be, I, look, I would be chuffed. I would be, I would be muchly chuffed if someone got an Alt Drift X tattoo. Um, I don't know. I don't know what kind of. I, I don't know. You you you'd get more than a retweet. That would be that would be really cool. Um, inadvisable, but really cool. Hadass says she's getting a Flemant Brax face tattoo. That that would be great for employment. When I'm looking through resumes, when I'm looking to hire people, the first thing I look for uh, is a Flemant Brax face tattoo because that really represents the kind of go-getter attitude that I'm looking for um, in an employee. So that would be exciting. Um, anyway, so um, Joffrey says that uh, that he doesn't really care very much about King Robert's death. Um, and, um, and Sansa thinks about how a lady's armor is courtesy. Uh, and she apologizes for how Catelyn took Tyrion captive. And then Tyrion says, yeah, well, a great many people are sorry for that, and when I'm done, the sum may be a deal sorrier. Um, which is sort of one of those, like, a lot of crazy, crazy shit happens to Tyrion. Like, Tyrion gets falsely accused uh, of trying to kill Bran, and Tyrion gets abducted by Catelyn, and, and he gets accused of the death of Jon Arryn, and, like, all these people do all this bull- and, 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 and Littlefinger lies about the dagger. Like, all this bullshit happens to um, Tyrion, uh, and and he says here, like, it's foreshadowed that Tyrion's going to get some fucking recompense for this BS. Uh, F- Fabian Kester says that Mance Raider hired the cat's paw. Um, that, w- that, that, is, that is some deep web theorizing there. Uh, w- w- maybe we'll, we'll do a video on that one day, or someone will do a video on that one day, I'm sure. Anyway, um, so, so Tyrion has this moment of saying, like, yeah, man, like, I'm going to get revenge for all the bullshit that everyone did to me. And yet... He never does. Like, Tyrion never gets revenge on, like, Littlefinger for totally framing him and fucking up his life, which is weird. Um, <laughs> Smash Dabber was getting a hello rock on the left nipple. That would be uh, hilarious. I don't know how you'd throw such a le- uh, such a hello rock. Um, might be uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> Latveria 1024 thinks that they can get a bargain on some real estate in Guyana for a cult shrift X meetup. Where's Guyana? Uh, is that a real place, or is that some kind of Lovecraftian secret city? Uh, Guyana. Um, it's a sovereign state on the northern mainland of South America. Uh, it's considered part of the Caribbean region because of strong cultural, historical, and political ties. Interesting. Oh, ExxonMobil has made a seventh oil discovery sh- uh, offshore of Guyana. Does that bode well? I don't know. All right. Um, so yeah, go to Goyan, bring the cordial. Anyway, so um, Tyrion, uh, I- yeah, does some weird foreshadowing that never really goes anywhere. Um, uh, they talk about politics. All sorts of people are calling themselves themselves kings these days. Tyrion says, which is sort of a, a subtle jab at um, Joffrey. Um, and and Joffrey's like, so what did you get for me for my birthday, uh, Uncle? Um, and, um, and he really sounds like Dudley Vernon to me. What, what, no, what, what's the name? Well, in Harry Potter, what's Dudley's surname? Dudley, what's, what's the surname of the family? Dursley. Dudley (laughs) Dursley. You got to give J.K. Rowling credit for coming up with really fucking good names. J.K. Rowling is great with names. Anyway, so Joffrey's like, what, what, what present did you get me? Tyrion, and Tyrion says, I brought you my wits, which is, which is like the equivalent of socks 
in terms of uh, disappointing Christmas presents, I think. Um, and uh, and Sandor warns Tyrion to guard his tongue, which I think is good advice. Sandor actually has some great um, some great life advice. Um, and uh, and then Sansa is left alone with Tyrion uh, and tries to think of some small talk. Uh, and um, and they talk about Tyrion's injury on the battle, which is fine. Uh, and Tyrion has another sort of compassionate moment saying like, you know, Sansa, are you okay? Like, are you, are you in grieving for your father? Like he shows concern for Sansa and Sansa uses her armor of courtesy. And she says, I am loyal to my beloved Joffrey. She says, just as a reflex. Um, and Tyrion says, oh, well, no doubt you're as loyal as a deer surrounded by wolves. Uh, and Sansa whispers lions. Which is a really beautiful moment of her betraying her true feelings for a moment. Um, but in the future, like even though Tyrion promises that I shall not savage you, uh, Sansa remains very suspicious of Tyrion. Um, he is no friend, she thinks, um, because Sansa has been burned before by trusting people um, and then uh, being betrayed. And Sansa says that she will never make that mistake again. So. That's an incredibly depressing end to this chapter, with Sansa concluding by saying that, yep, my new strategy is not to reach out to people at all and never trust anyone ever again because I've been bitten once and I don't want to get burned again. Uh, we're mixing our, our metaphors, um, but that's all right. Um, and I think it's, again, very similar to Arya's situation. Like, Arya feels uh, increasingly throughout her arc as though she's been betrayed and let down by people like Gendry and Hot Pie and the Brotherhood Without Banners, and so that stops Arya from reaching out to people in an honest, uh, intimate way ever again, which is fucking uh, depressing and sad, and in the same way that Arya has to, has to sequester away her real identity, Sansa does the same. Um, they're so repressed and they're so scarred and, like, all the Stark kids, I think especially Arya and Sansa, um... Uh, and and it sucks, but I think what these arcs are going for, I, th I think I think what we're told when we're told the North remembers is that deep down inside Arya, inside uh, Sansa, inside all of the Starks, there is uh, a, 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 an intact, strong Stark identity, um, and people people deep down still have strength and character, and and there will be that moment where they will rise up again. And they will be actualized into their truest, realest selves at some point. They will return and they will grow and they will rise harder and stronger. Um, and we will see Sansa be peak Sansa and peak Arya. And I, and I hope that one day we shall see the Starks be, 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 be Stark again. <laughs> uh, thank you for participating. In this stream, I hope you enjoyed. I'm sorry that the uh, stream quality was uh, shite earlier on. Um, we'll have to look into ways to fix that. Uh, a podcast fe uh, uh, feed for Alt Drift X. We actually will set that up in the near future. Um, look, look, look to the west on the on the seventh day at, at Helm's Deep, and, and and we will get a um, we will get a podcast feed for Alt Drift X, um, which should be a good. Uh, easy way to access this show um, and yeah first anniversary great um, I'm really glad that this Ultra Drift X thing is still a thing uh, Smash Dava asks for a Q&A uh, if anyone wants to chuck some questions I'll answer them right now um, well I won't necessarily answer them but I'll I'll ramble something in response um, and I'm really glad that, that all you guys enjoy this ridiculous show I'm really glad that you guys have made stuff. There's all this cool stuff happening in the Swifty Squad, um, in that Facebook group and stuff. Um, and there's some really uh, cool things happening in the Swifty verse. Uh, so thank you all for being a part of that and for listening. Um, uh, are there any? Wet Dick Daddy asks, "How old are you?" Uh, I'm one year old. Alt Drift X was born one year ago. Um, and it's been an interesting year, and I've learned a lot. Uh, I learned to walk and to talk. I actually learned to talk long before I learned to walk. The whole sort of de developmental cycle of um, of of the Swift, the life cycle, is is complicated. The the, the Swift emerges from a pupae um, early on uh, in it in its life cycle, um, and it and it exclusively eats uh, aphids for the first eight weeks of its life. 
um, and then it goes through a sort of uh, larval stage um, in its sort of second month, um, and um, and uh, and then it uh, hatches. And um, uh, anyway, uh, can you ride a bike? Tilly asks. Um, well, I've sort of I sort of swore off cycling ever since my uh, glass crater skateboarding accident. Um, all all forms of uh, wheeled locomotion are a bit triggering for me. Um, although I make a, a special exception for uh, unicycles. Um, have your parents tried drowning you in a bath yet? <laughs> uh, not yet. Uh, but you know, m- maybe at any moment it could happen. Um, that's that's why I stay away from baths. Deathly fear of baths. Actually, I actually bathe in sand was something I learned in my Saharan days. Um, bathing in sand is actually great. It's very, very comfortable. Um, and, 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 you know, like, like fucking sun heated sand. It's like a beautiful, it's like warm. It's great. Uh, I recommend sand baths. Um, have you let the book club idea die? Stephanie asks, no, uh, that I think will happen. Ideas take a long time to gestate in, 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 in the Swift. You gotta, you gotta let stuff brew, uh, before stuff happens sometimes. And I think we'll get there. Um, Danny DeVito's younger brother, <laughs> great name, asks, uh, how do you think the Game of Thrones show is heading quality-wise? Uh, I think obviously they're making a lot of cuts and simplifications and streamlines in order to get this big complex story, uh, out in a reasonable amount of time, um, and that means simplifying politics, simplifying character arcs in a lot of ways, um, and so I think that Game of Thrones, the show, has lost a lot of the complexity that gave Game of Thrones a great identity early on. Um, I think that is sad, um, but I think it's understandable. I mean, we can't keep, um, we can't keep doing super complex political plots down to the very end. Um, I think, and, and, and they haven't got books to draw from. I think D&D have shown that they have done their best work. Uh, th- th- they do really well when they're adapting George Martin's writing. They tend to do less well when they try to write their own political intrigue. Like, I mean, just look at, like, Winterfell in Season 7 and se- Season 6, right? Like, a lot of the D&D political plots are bad, uh, let's be honest. Um, but D&D have shown that what they are good at is huge, spectacular CGI battle set pieces, right? Um, which, you know, might not be as cool as, as politics and character development in a lot of ways. But I think it's appropriate enough for the for the finale of Game of Thrones, for tying everything together... Um, I think it's understandable that that's what's happening, and I think it'll be entertaining as fuck. Um, and I'm also just glad that it's you know happening, it's ending, right? Like the Game of Thrones books are kind of in um, are kind of in a bit of uh, <laughs> a limbo at the moment. No one knows if the books will ever happen, let alone whether they'll be good. So I'll take an ending to the series over an uncertain, maybe never ending any day. Man, that was a rambling ramble about endings anyway um yeah all right cool so thank you all for participating um and have a good week uh we'll continue doing the clash of kings abridged uh sort of uh whenever the time feels right um and we'll see you in the next episode and look up for the podcast feed i think we'll post it in like the youtube feed at some point um, have a good and brush your teeth, floss, flossing's great, um, and for any more hot health advice, ask, uh, Hairless Oyster, he's good with that. See ya. <laughs>